remember thinking, this isn't going to last very long. I was told there was no chance. He was kind of angry and he was always very gruff. I just thought he's not really my type. First impressions. Those gut feelings we get about people the first time we meet them. He would always walk in the office and walk by my desk with his head down. He was very shy. I said, seems like she's nice, but I don't know. I've had tried nice and I don't know. I, I can't pretend that it was love at first sight. <laughs> Is it possible that sometimes we judge so quickly we miss out on the loves of our lives? In 1797, a young woman began writing a book about first impressions. In fact, that was what she originally called it, First Impressions. Somewhat later, she decided to change the title to Pride and Prejudice. It's a story that people have loved for nearly 200 years. Pride and Prejudice tells the story of a strong-minded heroine and a proud hero who have very wrong ideas about each other. They must overcome their own prejudices if they are to find true love. Pride and Prejudice remains one of the most widely read books ever published, and other writers are among its most ardent fans. Good books last and great books really last. The amazing thing about all of her books is that you can read them over and over and over and always get this amazing emotional rush. I needed a plot. So I was so in love with Pride and Prejudice myself, I thought, well, I'll just steal that plot. I thought she won't mind. Um, and I thought it had been well market researched over a number of centuries, so I just took it. I think she wrote it when she was 22 originally and then rewrote it later. But she's got this kind of conviction, this is what she wants to do, this is what she's going to do, and by some miracle she gets it exactly right. From the very start of Pride and Prejudice, it's clear that Jane Austen has her tongue firmly planted in her cheek. It begins with one of the most famous and best loved lines in all of literature. Long before I read this book, my mother used to recite this at the dinner table. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man... That a single man in possession of a good fortune... In possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. Must be in want of a wife. Must be in want of a wife. From whose perspective is that said? It has to be from a woman. So it is, true, it is a truth universally acknowledged, in brackets, among women, that a single man, a catch, in possession of a good fortune, a better catch, must be in want of a wife, me. When a truly excellent catch moves into a small town, the hunt begins. That man is going to be pounced on by the mothers and daughters of the neighborhood. We understand that a person who can write this line is saying to us, isn't this a preposterous way to find people to marry? It's a great first line, isn't it? Pride and Prejudice is set in the small and confined world of the five Bennett sisters. Their lives revolve around whether they will ever find love and marriage, especially marriage. In the 19th century, the choices for women were distinctly limited, as Jane Austen well knew. She wrote about getting married because that was a woman's only career. There was nothing else to write about. And that was the big career choice that determined the rest of your life. That was it. There was no divorce. There was no becoming a working mother. 
that was it. Matrimony may not be the imperative it was in Austin's day, but like the Bennett girls, many young women are still searching for Mr. Wright. The modern fairy tale ending of finding true love is the wedding. Today, the final chapter often begins in the dressing room of a bridal shop. You just kind of get that feeling where you know that he's like your soulmate. Every time he opened his mouth, just these pearls of wisdom came out. The first time I saw him, I know that was the guy. Kissed many a frog. <laughs> but he's my prince charm. <laughs> you know what they did with that? The Bennett sisters are looking for their princes, too. But at the center of it all is the sister who's a little bit different. The book's heroine, Elizabeth, known as Lizzie. When Jane Austen gave life to Lizzie, she did something that has left an indelible mark on many of the books we read today. Austen's novels are the first novels in English in which a character genuinely changes. A believable, plausible, uh, fully defined character undergoes a profound inward and outward change. Lizzie is a girl that women the world over admire. She's clever and self-assured and quite opinionated. There is a stubbornness about me that never can bear to be frightened at the will of others. My courage always rises with every attempt to intimidate me. But something will have to happen to her before she can find the love she's searching for. She's very independent. She's entirely her own woman. If she is to find love or anything else, it's because she thinks her way toward it. Uh, she discovers something in herself. Um, and she admits, and she admits to the possibility of change. Many people suspect that Elizabeth is a thinly disguised Jane Austen. Well, that might explain why she was the writer's favorite character. I must confess that I think her as delightful a creature as ever appeared in print. And how I shall be able to tolerate those who do not like her, I do not know. Jane Austen made Lizzie an independent spirit, a daring thing in the early 19th century. Because wealth and status were the tickets to a secure future, there was enormous pressure to marry well. But Lizzie will not settle for stability only. She wants love. It's a sentiment that most women of the day, including her mother, could not afford to share with five girls to marry off. No one took the business of marriage more seriously than Mrs. Bennett. She was a woman of mean understanding, little information, and uncertain temper. The business of her life was to get her daughters married. Given the small amount of brains that God endowed her with, She's perfectly right. I mean, the young Jane Austen made fun of her and said the business of her life was to get her daughters married. But that was an extremely important business. The Bennett girls have problems that we know nothing of. Women in the 19th century had few legal rights. Trained in little but sewing and French, they were limited to domestic and social duties. Colleges only admitted men which left few options for women who desired or needed a career. The choices usually boiled down to governess, tutor, or writer. Marriage was the conventional answer, but it was a tricky business. In the 19th century, there were rules, rules about courtship of which only vestiges remain. Today, at some girls' schools, young ladies are introduced 
to society in a centuries-old tradition. Miss Marissa Sakilabon Keto. It's a remnant of a time when ritual was the prelude to romance. Miss Angela Sue Cosgrove. In Austin's day, the young women of the gentry did not socialize with men until they were introduced. Each family would bring out their eldest daughter, and only when she was safely wed would the next in line be presented. The rules were very clear, and everyone was playing to the same rules. You had to go through a number of hoops to end up married, but we all knew, everyone knew what the hoops were. Mrs. Bennett bends the rules and introduces all of her girls to society at once. After all, there's no point wasting time, is there? If I can but see one of my daughters happily settled and all the others equally well married, I shall have nothing to wish for. Poor Mrs. Bennett, who actually had the reality of everything at her fingertips, what were, was going to happen to these girls if they didn't get married and soon. Marriage may not be the cutthroat business it once was, but mothers will still be, well... I kind of thought maybe she might just never get married. You keep saying no to everybody, you know? Mothers. We can still see a little Mrs. Bennett in many of them. So beautiful. This is you, Lisa. <laughs> She's crying again. We're all going to start crying. <laughs> And you'll be on his right or left? Uh, I'm on his, uh... I don't at this point to be a... For better or worse, we <laughs> cannot choose our families. And Lizzie, too, can only endure hers. In a world where finding a wealthy spouse depends on a family's status and manners, Lizzie's clan lacks both. I don't think we love Elizabeth just because she's so smart. I think we also sense that she's alone, that except for her older sister, she's surrounded with such fools. You really have a sense that she leads a very complicated, solitary life, a complicated inner life and, and there's no question when you start reading the book, you think, oh, is this woman going to end up all by herself? Because she's way too smart and way too poor to ever find a husband. Lizzie's closest ally in the Bennett family is her older sister, the lovely and sweet-tempered Jane. When the Bennett girls go to a local ball, a rich bachelor, Mr. Bingley, falls in love with Jane at first sight. And Bingley's very eligible friend, Fitzwilliam Darcy, makes a strong first impression on the entire party, including Lizzie. Mr. Darcy soon drew the attention of the room by his fine, handsome features and the report of his having 10,000 a year, till his manners gave a disgust, for he was discovered to be proud, to be above his company and above being pleased. Elizabeth's first impression of Darcy is that he's proud and he's horrid. <laughs> and, and then, you know, the rest of the book, she has to change her mind and see some virtues and some qualities in them. And, and, and his first impression of her is that she's just one of this, this rather terrible family. Wouldn't be a punishment for me to stand up for it. Hollywood got the chemistry right with Laurence Olivier and Greer Garson in this 1940 version of Pride and Prejudice. But there's that sister of hers, Miss Elizabeth. They say she has quite a lively wit. Oh, a provincial young lady with a lively wit, heaven preserve us. And there's that mother of her. It's not the mother you have to dance with, Darcy, it's the daughter. She's charming. Yeah, she looks tolerable enough. In that first encounter, Elizabeth and Darcy get off on the wrong foot. They misjudge each other and both fail to see their mistake. When Mr. Darcy rejected her at the first dance, she sort of gives him it and carries on giving him it. And that's what attracts him because every other woman is just falling over him because he's rich. Of all the arrogant, detestable snobs. Oh, but Lizzie, he didn't know you were listening. What difference does that make? He'd have said it just the same if he had. 
Oh, she looks tolerable enough. But I'm in no humor tonight to give consequence to the middle classes that play. It's not at all that they're physically right for one another. It's that they're intellectually suited. It's truly, you know, what we call a match of wits. And, and we believe that they are two people who belong together because they are smart enough for each other. That's, that, of course, is a very romantic thing. Straight, straight, straight. Now turn sideways toward the target. Aim for the bullseye. I don't think it's just an intellectual thing. Bullseye. Mr. Darcy's a seething hotbed of passion, suppressed beneath proprietary. And that's what's so exciting about it. And Elizabeth, too, you know, she's an earthy girl, I think. It's terribly romantic and, and quite erotic in a, in, a, in, a subdued, in a subdued way because there is no mention of sex in it. And yet the whole thing is so kind of powerful because it's unsaid and because it's hidden. Something that, that we're very, con you get very connected to because you keep wanting her to find out what you already know about him, which is that really he's, he's just misunderstood and flawed. And that misunderstanding is the key to the genre that Jane Austen all but created, the romantic comedy. You can trace almost all romantic comedy to, well, probably Shakespeare, but then Jane Austen. You know, you look at Taming of the Shrew and Pride and Prejudice, and you can pretty much find strands of it in most, um, in most romantic comedies. Some of the descendants of those first romantic comedies ended up on the big screen. All those famous couples shared one thing. They got off to a very rocky start. Nora Ephron has put the Austin formula to good use herself with hits like When Harry Met Sally and Sleepless in Seattle. Kathleen Kelly. And you've got mail. She even gives her favorite book a nod. Do you mind if I sent down? Yes, yes, I would, actually. I'm expecting someone. Thanks. Pride and Prejudice. Do you mind? I bet you read that book every year. I bet you just love that Mr. Darcy, and your sentimental heart just beats wildly at the thought that he and, um, well, you know, whatever her name is, are truly, honestly going to end up together. There are conventions of romantic comedies one of which is that two people who take a very strong dislike to one another must be fated to be together. It's a completely bizarre notion that causes some of us to think if we go out with someone we didn't like that he might be the person for us. Every day people make judgments right or wrong based on first impressions. Luckily for some, there are second chances. He was kind of angry and he was always messy and, and he was at the high school he would like bash through the doors. I was like, this is going to be bad. I'm going to end up not liking him, dumping him, and getting fired. <laughs> so I told my mother, and she said, do not go out with him. Do not go out with him. He had a reputation of being a person you would like to go out with, but do not get serious about. I was attracted to him, but I really didn't know I was attracted to him. You have been my neighbor for seven years, That's but right. during the seven years, it was about only four times that we ran into each other in the neighborhood. Good love stories never die. Can he have done Jane Austen's this? very good at basic stories, and this is a story of a girl falling for the wrong guy and missing the right guy and then getting off with the right guy in the end. And you just want her to get off with Mr. Darcy all the way through, and it's very basic, but it's so enjoyable. Jane Austen was modest about her achievements. She said that her books were only about three or four families in a village. But in those three or four families, she found a universal truth. Even though it was so long ago, the reason it endures is that it has truth at its heart, truth about human character and truth about female character. The author who was so astute, who knew so much about love and marriage, never married. 
You still cannot imagine how she made up this amazing series of families and romantic entanglements that is so real and so, so um, emotionally, imaginatively true. Still, an image of Jane Austen as a lonely spinster is misleading. Admittedly, we know little about her life. But what we do know comes from her letters, and they reveal someone who went to parties, who loved shopping and shared gossip. I danced twice with Warren last night, and to my inexpressible astonishment, I entirely escaped John Lipton. You say nothing of the silk stockings I purchased, as I cannot very well afford to pay for them. All my money is spent in buying white gloves and pink... Miss Macklin's are both pretty-ish, with large eyes and a good deal of nose. Jane Austen was born in 1775, the seventh of eight children in an intellectual family. Encouraged by her parents, she began writing when she was only 11. Even then she was funny, writing silly histories and little playlets, including a satirical history of England. She turned the English monarchy from Henry IV to Charles I upside down, hilariously funny to read, and even funnier when adapted onto a stage production. But I think that just shows that even at that stage, the spark was there. At 21, she sat down and began her first novel, which she called First Impressions. Her father sent it to a publisher who returned it unread. We now know, of course, this is the biggest mistake anyone's ever made in publishing, because some 15 years later, after it is revised and retitled, it becomes, of course, the novel we now know as Pride and Prejudice. After the book's rejection, she went through a difficult time. The family moved from her beloved home in Hampshire, and five years later, her father died. Legend has it that there was another blow. Some believe she lost a love, a young man she met on holiday but never saw again. They assumed that the suitor would come and follow Jane. Unfortunately, some accident or illness supervened, and Jane just learned sometime after that he died. Seem to be very upset about this. Some people even suggest that this actually put her off writing for a while. We don't really know for certain. There's nothing on the record. It is very much conjecture. She had at least one other suitor. Harris Big Wither was a man of wealth, a match that would have secured her and her family's future. When he proposed, Jane said yes, but then had a change of heart. She has a sleepless night, we're told, and the following morning, she had decided otherwise and turned him down. Did Jane perhaps decide overnight otherwise that if she were married and had a family obligation, she wouldn't have time to write? I wonder. Her life revolved around her family, her friends, her reading, and most of all, her writing. Sense and Sensibility was published in 1811. That same year, she began revising Pride and Prejudice, which was published in 1813. It was quite a hit. The first edition sold out, and it hasn't been out of print since. She didn't really want to be a celebrity character herself. What she wanted to enjoy, perhaps, was to be the observer on the sidelines, to pick up what was going on between the characters she was among, and later on, they'd be spilled out in some storyline of her own. Austin's life seems to have provided the fodder for Pride and Prejudice. Like the author, Lizzie finds herself faced with a proposal that she cannot accept. It comes from the pompous Mr. Collins, a cousin of the family who, as the closest male relative, stands to inherit the small family estate. He's so impervious to any doubt about the value of his character. And you kind of know people like that. And yet you don't dislike him for it. He's just kind of impossible, but yet acceptable at the same time because he's so silly. I love Mr. I love Mr. Collins. He looks to Elizabeth, but she is not about to settle for him, no matter what it means to her family. He proposes, she says no. Her mother is distraught, but her father is sympathetic. The love life of more than one Bennett girl is in jeopardy. 
Mr. Bingley has returned to London without a word to Jane. Lizzie consoles her sister, convinced Bingley still has feelings for Jane. It is these intimate details of life that Pride and Prejudice is concerned with, and therein lies its staying power. It doesn't seem to date because it doesn't focus on the tumultuous time in which it was written. Pride and Prejudice was, what, 1813, right in the middle of the Napoleonic Wars and all, most of her novels, too. Never mentions them, never mentions any of the uh, revolutionary upheavals that were happening in Europe at the time. So this is my world, this little cottage, this little room, this conversation is my world. And then, and this only happens in the hands of great writers, to say, but this is the universe. You know, this is the whole universe. This leaves your wars in the dust. I don't suppose it is that she took no notice of what was going on. It was just not appropriate to what she was writing about, which was the uh, the complexity of social relationships between between families and people and lovers and, and, and children and parents and the rest of it. Austin became a master of the complexities of human nature. She caught the tiniest details of how men and women make decisions about one another. And that doesn't appear to change. There's nothing remotely that you can't connect to now. You don't think, oh, it was like that then, but it isn't at all like that now. Women still look for the same things Lizzie wanted. But now there are books, tapes, and personal ads to aid in the search for the perfect mate. Whoever that might be. First of all, I know I'm looking for someone taller than me. Funny. It has to be funny. Very laid back, but has motivation. I look for intelligence. I need somebody intelligent and confident. A lot of guys, a lot of quirks out there, which you don't really feel like dealing with. To help deal, there's even a romance coach who's only a phone call away. Hi, this is Leslie. Um, I think that people idea. long for romance. In today's society where we operate with email and everything's so quick and we're multitasking all the time, uh, romance has gotten sort of pushed off to the side, but, and yet people miss it. You know, it's difficult out there when you're in your 30s and living in the city trying to date. So you find it's hard with work to really fit in that time for fun things. Karstner yeah. advises women to make time for romance and to get their priorities straight. I think the number one quality that I look for, that anyone should look for, is integrity. And I think when you find a man or a woman who is in integrity, acts in integrity, I think you've found a real catch. But as many of us know, it's usually not that easy. My mom is always, you know, and my, my dad too, always trying to introduce me to people, trying to be like, well, we know someone who knows someone who has a friend, who has a son. My younger brother was recently married, so that was a little bit of a pressure boost too. I mean, one time I told her that I'd been dating this guy, and she actually started crying when I told her that I broke up with him. <laughs> the tribulations of the single woman have been captured by writer Helen Fielding in her mega hit, Bridget Jones's Diary. It's a modern retelling of Austen's Pride and Prejudice. Fielding is unabashed about her inspiration for it. I did consider starting Bridget Jones's diary with the line, it is a truth universally acknowledged that a single woman over the age of 30 must be in want of a husband. Elizabeth Bennet and Bridget Jones are separated by nearly 200 years. And they are linked by a common sensibility. Although the manners, the system, the rules were different then. There's still the difference between a woman of integrity and a woman who's, you know, just going to go for the guy she doesn't love for the lifestyle is very relevant today. You can see it all around. Lizzie has integrity. She would rather be alone than with the wrong man. When Bingley leaves Jane, Elizabeth is furious with Darcy because she blames him for it. Fuel is added to the fire when Wickham tells her that Darcy has, in effect, denied him a livelihood that he was entitled to. The, the longer Elizabeth Bennet is blind, the longer Darcy is proud, the longer prejudice remains prejudice and pride remains pride, the more we want things to be right. Elizabeth 
Elizabeth is unaware that Darcy is intrigued by her. He orchestrates accidental meetings, but she sees these unlikely encounters as nothing more than an irritation. Then, from out of nowhere, Darcy proposes. Mr. Darcy really thought he was doing a good thing. You know, he'd thought all this through, he realized he was making a, a foolish match and everyone would disapprove of it. But nevertheless, he loved Elizabeth so much that he was prepared to discard all that and still ask her to marry him. But to Elizabeth, it just sounds like the rudest thing in the world, you know. You lucky girl. Um, I know your relatives are frightful and you're of low birth, but... You got lucky and I'm going to ask you to marry me. And so it is great when she says no. She has the courage to say no to a man whom every woman in England would love to snag. She's incredibly rebellious or, or uh, bold and determined and, and would rather be single than be married to such buffoons as uh, she thought Darcy was and that Mr. Collins is. Jane Austen described her writing as painting on ivory with tiny brush strokes. It is within the intricate delicacy of that design that she was able to capture the passion and power of love. In her short life of 41 years, Jane Austen finished six novels, all of them revised and rewritten and polished many times over until they shone. It was in the front parlor at Chawton Cottage that Austen found the peace and quiet she needed for her writing. Jane was seen to use the dining parlour and in that room today we have this very small, not quite round topped little oak table on a single pedestal by the window. In fact that's a very good position for it to be because there's almost constant daylight without any artificial aid from early morning to late afternoon, just the way the sun comes round the house. The hours she spent labouring over her books can only be imagined. Writing was one of the few respectable ways for women to earn a living, but it was still not socially acceptable for a woman of Jane's class to take credit for her work. Her first novel that was published, Sense and Sensibility, in 1811, on the frontispiece only shows it was by a lady. The next one, Pride and Prejudice, was by the author of Sense and Sensibility. And as we go on, novel by novel, we add one more title to the previous one. By the time we get to Emma, there are too many titles. So it's by the author of Pride and Prejudice, etc. Even though she never signed her works, her name was well known. The Prince Regent was a fan, and Austen dedicated her novel, Emma, to him. Her books brought her some financial success as well. For her life's work, she made the equivalent of about $60,000. Not necessarily great by today's standards. However, for a woman to have earned that in her own right was really exceptional. Today, Jane Austen would have made a killing. Lately, Austen mania has reached a fevered pitch. In the last five years alone, 11 major films and TV adaptations have been made from her works, and her books are selling better than ever. Perhaps in a time of confusion about the roles of men and women, the clarity of Austen has struck a chord. There's even a play about her life, performed by the British actress Judith French. My dearest Fanny, thank you for your letter. What is to be done? Mr. Plumtree, he has advantages, but do not think of accepting him unless you really do like him. Anything is to be preferred to marrying without affection. Your loving aunt, Jane Austen. So what does a woman who plays Jane Austen think about the kind of a woman she was? I enjoy her wit and I enjoy her ability to finally take a humorous look at the world, no matter how fed up she is. Um, I actually enjoy her irritability a great deal. I think she must have been a very irritable person. And I think a lot of the scenes she writes are where people are suppressing irritation, perhaps more successfully than she did in real life, who knows. French knows firsthand how intense the passion for Austen can be. 
people, once they start to get to know about her life, can't get enough of her. And you do hear people at Jane Austen Society meetings talking about her as if she was somebody that they were personally privileged to know. Um, with the same level of slight jealousy of anyone else's interest in her uh, that you associate with people having crushes on, on film stars, almost. Everybody can tell you when they read their first Jane Austen, it's like losing your virginity, nobody ever forgets. Edith Lank is one of the 4,000 members of JASNA, the Jane Austen Society of North America. Well, here we have, of course, the famous first line of Pride and Prejudice. And what's really fun is to look at it in all these translations. These two shelves are all translations. We've got it here in Japanese, which I can't read. I've got it in Basque, which is not bad. We have it here in Hebrew. No, this way. We've got it here in Icelandic. We've got it in Catalan, Russian, Hebrew, well, Turkish. Well, you get the um, idea. This is Finnish. This one's fun. This one's from Saudi Arabia. It went into Arabic, and then it came back into English, so that it is a truth universally acknowledged, comes out, as soon as a wealthy bachelor comes to live in a certain place, every neighbor considers him the future husband of one of his daughters. So-so. A for effort, anyhow. Austin is reborn again and again on the Internet. Of course, Jane Austen's all over the Internet. If you just put in the words, you'll get about 98 million uh, sites. Home pages, chat rooms, and databases are frequented by fans who enjoy reading, discussing, and bickering about Austin's works. She's everywhere. Somebody posted on the net that her younger sister was reading Pride and Prejudice and came to her halfway through and said, tell me right now if Darcy marries Elizabeth because if not, I'm not going to finish the book. <laughs> People who have read the book dozens of times still find it entrancing. It's such a wonderful book, and you get so caught up in it that you honestly start worrying whether things are going to turn out for the best, even knowing that they do. And I remember the first, the first two or three times I read it, having that thing of up till three in the morning, just not being able to bear putting it down. It's very rare that a book can do that once, much less over and over and over again. Elizabeth has her reasons for rejecting Darcy, but she is unaware of his true motives. Darcy was trying to protect Bingley by sending him away because he mistook Jane's shyness for indifference to his friend. And Darcy also knows that Wiccan is nothing but a dishonest fortune hunter. He explains himself in a letter that will change not only Lizzie's mind, but also her heart. Be not alarmed, madam, on receiving this letter by the apprehension of its containing any repetition of those sentiments or renewal of those offers which were last night so disgusting to you. When she first reads the letter, she does it with a total wish not to credit it and an anger against him. And then, little by little, the process we witness is of Elizabeth coming to understand both herself and Darcy. Elizabeth reads and rereads the letter. Finally, she begins to see the light. She grew absolutely ashamed of herself. Of neither Darcy nor Wickham could she think without feeling that she had been blind, partial, prejudiced, absurd. How despicably have I acted. I, who have prided myself on my discernment and gratified my vanity in useless or blamable distrust. How humiliating is this discovery. Had I been in love, I could not have been more wretchedly blind. Till this moment, I never knew myself. It is this moment in Pride and Prejudice in which Lizzie, by coming to know herself, becomes capable of loving Darcy. Mr. Darcy's letter, she was soon in a fair way of knowing by heart. And knowing by heart means knowing with feeling, memorizing, 
and thinking about so much that she can review the past. It's in those pages that I think she begins to realize that there's a, something to him she hadn't realized. But she doesn't love him yet until she sees him at Pemberley. Pemberley is Darcy's magnificent estate. Elizabeth is on holiday with her aunt and uncle when they insist on touring it. She panicked that she might run into Darcy, but is assured that he is not home. Lizzie is struck by the sheer beauty of the place. Suddenly, Darcy appears around a corner. She sees him with new eyes. I think it was maybe about the third date or so, and uh, he looked over at me, and I don't know, something I thought, I better remember his last name. I think when it turned around for me was when I met his son, and I saw how good he was with them as a father, and I'm like, you know, he's marrying material. You know when it's right, that's, that's true, I did. Well, let's just put it this way. Five months later, we were engaged. <laughs> Six months later, we were married. Yes. Austin does not rush love. She believes that it must have time to ripen. Grave obstacles will appear that will keep Lizzie and Darcy apart and give Lizzie more time to reflect. The 19 chapters that come after her discovery of her affection and growing love for, for Darcy do two important things. One is they show her moving toward measuring the greatness of, of the man she has fallen in love with. But they also show that love isn't something that happens instantaneously. Disaster strikes when Lizzie's sister Lydia, an outrageous flirt, runs off with a seductive Wickham. Such behavior could ruin an entire family. The implication to it is that until pressure is brought to bear, Lydia and Mr. Wickham are going to be living in sin. Now, no matter what might be the view today, in those days, it was out of the question. Anyone else in the family regaining a social position, even of their own equal status. The Bennets are disgraced. Elizabeth has no hope that the proud Darcy will ever want her again. But once again, she has misjudged him. The obstacle created by Lydia's running away with Wickham and Darcy's following them to London, it becomes a very precise way of measuring Darcy's worthiness. Darcy tracks down Wickham, a man he deplores. He pays the scoundrel's debts and bribes him to marry Lydia all for Elizabeth's sake. He has saved the Bennett family's reputation, but insists on remaining anonymous. When Elizabeth's aunt discloses all that he has done for them, Elizabeth is moved, and so are we. He only did it because he loved her. All these steps and her appraisal of what he's doing are a way of deepening her understanding of how truly worthy he is. It's not just a marriage uh, because women must marry. It's that she has come to know how very wonderful he is. And he too. Pride and Prejudice is a joyous book. It seems to say that if we can look at ourselves in the eye like Lizzie, we too may have a happy ending. We went to Turkey and we went to this very romantic restaurant and I popped a question uh, on... Shocked me. <laughs> Should show you the pictures, I'm just... <laughs> I wasn't real shocked, but it's always that formal thing, will you marry me, that kind of throws you. It was Christmas time and I knew that I probably wasn't going to be able to go through another holiday season without. Of course know. he makes it sound like it's a guilt thing and he didn't just want to do it. I knew I was running out of time. 
Of course I said yes, but I was going to ask her. But uh, she beat me to the punch. <laughs> but it, 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 it all worked out. It sure did. Jane Austen never found that one true love. She died at the young age of 41 after a struggle with a painful illness. I think she did believe in true love, or I get that feeling from her books. I feel sad that she didn't get the guy herself, and I know that she did love someone, didn't she, and then it all went wrong and, and so on. So I hope it made her happy that, that she got the happy endings in of fiction. There are different kinds of love. Jane Austen loved life, loved her books. That love has been requited by millions of readers for two centuries and will be, no doubt, for centuries to come.